as we begin verse 15 of chapter 1 of Colossians, um, we begin what is one of the most exalted and majestic passages in the entire Bible in regards to the identity of Jesus, the Son of God, the beloved Son, as verse 13 describes him. Um, remember, this is coming out of verses 9 through 14 that we just finished studying, where Paul was encouraging the Colossian believers, um, saying that I've been praying that you would be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to God's glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, and giving thanks to God the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And he said, Look, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness, that rule and authority of Satan, and he's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. And now um, <clears throat> Paul is coming out of this passage and, and he's beginning to describe the one of whom he just referred to in verse 13, this beloved son. And as he does so, it's almost like he begins to just worship and just be in awe of the glory of this Savior. He says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. And He's before all things. And in Him, all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things to himself in heaven and on earth, making peace by the blood of his cross. Praise God. Praise Jesus. Paul is just worshiping this King of kings, this Lord of Lords. And it's like Paul just wants us to lift our eyes off of the things of this world. He's been telling them, look, live your lives in a manner that's worthy of this Lord. Live your lives in a manner that's fully pleasing to this God. Amen. Bear fruit in every good work. Increase in the knowledge of God. Be strengthened with all power. Endure and be patient with all joy. And give thanks to God the Father who's qualified you to share in this inheritance. Delivering you from that domain of darkness. The rule and authority and kingship of Satan. And transferred us in to this kingdom of this beloved son. The image of the invisible God. Lift your eyes off the things of this world and just lift them higher and higher and higher and higher until you can take in the fullness of who he truly is. Because if we can grasp the fullness, the truth of who Jesus really is, it makes it so much easier to not hold on to and grab for the, the meager, feeble, worthless things of this world. And the Colossians needed this bigger understanding and this vision of who Christ is. Remember the things that were threatening them. They had the Judaizers. They were coming into the church, this relatively new church in Colossae, and they were trying to put these believers back under the law of Moses. Say, so it's great you believed in our Jewish Messiah, but, but you know, we got to get you circumcised <clears throat> and we got to get you back under, you know, these dietary restrictions and the feasts and new moons and Sabbaths. You really need to follow the law of Moses because, you know, it is a Jewish Messiah after all. So it's great that you believe in our Jewish Messiah. But if you really want to be saved by him, you've got to be Jewish. And so what you need is you need Jesus plus the law of Moses. Okay, and then you had the pagans on the other side, the mystery religions, the cults, this early form of Gnosticism that says, you know, um, it's great that you entered the door to the world of the spirit through this Christ of yours. But now you need to seek the higher things. You know, we got to get you worshiping these angels, these angelic beings, and, and, and seeking visions so that you can reach higher planes of enlightenment through asceticism and, and, and these other practices. And, and Paul saying, no, 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 no. Lift your eyes higher, right? Jesus came and fulfilled the law of Moses. And the things that they're trying to put you under Colossians, the feasts and new moons and Sabbaths and circumcision and dietary, these are the things that testify of him. 
These were the shadows of which Christ is the substance. He came and fulfilled all righteousness on our behalf, and then he paid the full penalty for our sins upon the, the cross by shedding his blood and giving up his life. And now we are saved because of him. It is through Christ, through by grace, through faith we've been saved, and that not of ourselves. And to the pagans, why would we worship angels when we worship the one who created every angel. By him all things were created in heaven and on earth. Does it say some things? Does it say a couple things? Everything but one thing? No, all things. By him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, right? Through him and for him all things were created. He's before all things and in him all things hold together. You need to understand this, Colossians, because you have to understand that if you have Jesus, you have everything you need. You can't earn it. You can't get it any other way. You can't seek it any other way. There's no higher. There's no mystery that you're going to find anywhere else because all the mysteries that have been hidden for ages are now revealed to the saints in the last days. Amen. And this is the mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. If you have Christ, there's no more further mystery. There's no more further knowledge. There's no more further planes of enlightenment. You have everything. You have the ruler. You have the creator who was there in the beginning and spoke it all into existence. You have the logos. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Amen. So what I want to do is I want to focus in on just this first verse of this passage. He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. So what does it mean that Jesus is the image of the invisible God? Well, the first way that the, the Bible uses this term, or Paul uses this term image, is in regards to sonship. Remember in Genesis 1, verse 27, when God created Adam and Eve, it says, so God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay, and then in Luke, it's giving the genealogy of Jesus. It starts at Jesus, goes all the way back to God. And, and in verse 38, it says the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. And so we see Luke interpret this image language in terms of sonship. And this is confirmed again in Genesis chapter 5, when Seth is born to Adam. It says, when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Okay, that's sonship. He is the image of his father and the firstborn over all creation. This is also sonship. And so image is used in terms of sonship. Now we don't get excluded from this in Romans 8. Paul says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers. And so we are being conformed into the image of Christ, who is the image of his father, that we might take part and be a part of this family of God, the sons and the daughters of God. In this way, God is our father as well. And in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says it this way, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to the other. Okay, so this is image, but what does it mean that Jesus is the image of the invisible God? We, we remember that the Bible teaches that God is spirit. In fact, um, when Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman, it was in John chapter four, remember he told her God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is spirit and we've been given physical bodies, physical eyes, and we can see light. We can see physical matter. Light reflects off physical matter, and this is what we can see. We've been given senses adequate for survival and to thrive within this universe in which he's created. So he has not given us eyes that can see behind the veil, into the heavenlies, into the spirit realm. God is spirit, okay? Um, in 1 Timothy, Paul puts it this way. He says, He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. We cannot see God the Father. 
God is spirit. He dwells in unapproachable light. Moses asked the Father when he was on the mountain. Remember, Moses was uh, faithful in all of God's house as a servant. God was pleased with Moses. Moses was on the mountain. He says, please show me your glory. And God the Father responds this way. He said, I will make my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. Okay, so God is spirit, but Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And Jesus reveals to his creation the Father, his Father. Okay? So in John 14, remember this. Um, he's about to go to the cross. Jesus is about to go to the cross. He's telling his disciples, I'm about to go to my Father. And they don't really understand what he's saying. So Philip says, Jesus, just show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And it says Jesus, I can just picture him looking at Philip, you know. And Jesus says to him, have I been with you so long, and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever's seen me has seen the Father. In other words, if you've seen me, Philip, you've seen God, okay? So, so you've been with me this whole time. As I was, you saw me walking on water. You saw me command the, the wind and the waves and they obeyed me. You saw me raise Lazarus and raise the young man who was in the funeral procession and raise the J Jairus' daughter from the dead, Talitha Kumi. You saw them rise from the dead and live. You saw me feed 5,000 and 7,000 with a few loaves and fishes. You saw the blind see, the deaf hear, the mute talk, the lame walk. You've been with me this whole time, Philip, and do you still not know me? If you've seen me, you've seen God the Father. So how can you say to me, show me the Father, right? If you've seen Jesus, you've seen God because Jesus reveals his Father. In Hebrews 1, 3, it says it this way, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus is God. And to see Jesus is to see the Father. He is the same in nature. He is the same in character. He is God. Second Corinthians 4, 6 says this, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Amen. So we see Jesus, we see the Father. He is the eternal image of God. He is the Logos, the Word of God. And we'll go more into these concepts as we progress through this passage. But what does it mean? We know what it means now. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. What does it mean that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation? I want to go back to Hebrews chapter 1 for this. Another amazing passage, if you want to read that one as well. The first, first couple uh, paragraphs of that Hebrews chapter 1 is powerful. But in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, uh, the writer says this. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Firstborn over all creation. Some people get confused here and they start thinking, well, does this mean that Jesus was the first of the created things and then God created everything else through him? But you don't get that by reading this passage. Remember what the passage says, okay? And he is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation. Now listen, for by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things were created through him. And this last phrase right here gives us the clue. And for him, right? Firstborn over all creation. Remember the, the term firstborn brings back to mind um, stories like, Esau and Jacob. And remember that God told Rachel while they were still in the room, still in the womb, the older will serve the younger. Remember that Esau was out hunting one day. Jacob was making some stew. Esau came in hungry and he said, give me some of that stew. Jacob said, I'll give you the stew, but you got to sell me your birthright. Esau's like, well, what good's my birthright if I fall over dead? So go oh, fine. I'll sell you my birthright. Give me some stew. So he eats the stew, goes away. 
So that birthright represented his right as the firstborn son, the eldest son, to a double portion of his father's inheritance. Jesus is the firstborn and the only begotten of his father, the firstborn over all creation. This implies birthright, okay? And then we see this in Hebrews chapter 1. He says, whom he, God, has appointed Jesus, the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Jesus is the image of the invisible God in the sense of sonship. He is the image of the invisible God in, in the way that he reveals God the Father to us as his creation. And he is the firstborn over all creation in regards to his sonship, his birthright, and that all things in this universe were created for him. They were created by him, through him, but we were all, everything, us and everything in this created order was created for the only begotten son, the beloved son of God, and we are his inheritance. Amen. So we'll get into verse 16 in the next video.